Okay, I think we can start the program die uh, right now. What is the principal sir of food hill or post to do? Sir of the security. So, good afternoon, everyone. Respected guest, research person, and participants. Um, I wanted to have a convention of the webinar. Uh, um, on behalf of the entire organizing committee, welcome you all to the national webinar on abrogation of Article 370 and Contemporary Kashmir, organized by Center for Ethnic Studies and Research in association with the Department of Political Science, Dudnoy College, Dudnoy. Uh, during this period of lockdown, uh, due to COVID-19, we all are under the threat of insecurity and are facing lots of challenges in our day-to-day -day life. However, in the midst of all these uh, troubles and all these challenges, we fortunately are having technologies that give us a virtual platform to join together in the path of teaching, learning, and sharing knowledge. Uh, by taking this opportunity, Center for Ethnic Studies and Research has also been conducting webinars, workshops, and discussions on various topics. Today, we jointly with the uh, Center for Ethnic Studies and Research and the Department of Political Science to are uh, here today with uh, a very uh, exciting and relevant topic that is abrogation of Article 370 and contemporary Kashmir. Uh, now, I think uh, we should go according to our agenda. Uh, as per agenda, I uh, request Dr. Lolit Chandra Rabha, Honorable Principal of Dudnoy College, to deliver his welcome address. Uh, Principal, sir. Principal, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. <coughs> Honorable Professor Dong Kongam Jongel, sir, head of the Department of Political Science of Mizoram University, respected Dr. Bolin Hazurita, President of All yeah. Assam Political. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Good afternoon, Honorable Hello. Professor John Kangam Dongel, Head of the Department of Political Science, Mizoram University, respected Dr. Bolin Hajorika, President of All Assam Political Science Forum, Dr. Prasanto Sarma, Head of the Political Science, Dutnoi College, and other colleague members of the Department of Political Science of Dudnoy College, office bearers of Center of Center for <laughs> Studies and Research and Participants. All are welcome to this webinar 
At first, I want to say briefly about Dudnoy College. Dudnoy College is a premier higher educational institution. It was established in 1972 with our system. Now it has three streams, that is our science and commerce. In the pandemic period of COVID-19, we have been organizing various online programs. We have su successfully completed two seven days faculty development program and two national webinar on various topics. The Department of Political Science and Center for Ethnic Studies and Research jointly organized this national webinar on the abrogation of Article 370 and Contemporary Kashmir. I hope this webinar will benefit the participant. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lolit Chandra Ravasar, for your welcome address. Uh, now I request Dr. Dipon Das, uh, Organizing Secretary of Center for Ethnic Studies and Research, to deliver a short speech about CSR. Uh, Dr. Tipandas. Thank you, Dr. Barbara. A very good afternoon to all of you. Respected principal sir of the Dunoy College, honorable inaugurator of this webinar, Professor Bolin Hazorika, president of All Assam Political Science Association, and honorable resource person, Professor Dongal, the Department of Political Science, Bizram University and the faculties of Dudnoy College and the office bearers of Center for Ethnic Studies and Research and all the participants attending this webinar. I welcome all of you to this program. Here, I would like to speak a few words about the center. The Center for Ethnic Studies and Research is a registered academic society which was established in the year 2015 with an objective to organize seminar, conference, workshops, demonstrations, public campaigns on various ethnic and socio-political issues. We have also published a half-yearly peer-reviewed journal, Journal of Humanities and Social Science Research. In 2019, we have extended our collaboration in a seven-day ICSSR NERC sponsored national workshop on human rights education in Northeast India, issues and challenges. During this period of COVID-19, we are, we, the executive committee of this Center for Ethnic Studies and Research have made an attempt to organize a number of webinars as well as lecture series on various ethnic and socio-political issues. And today's webinar the, on the topic COVID-19, sorry, on this uh, topic of abrogation of Article 370 and the present day Kashmir is also a part of this. We hope our participants will be benefited out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dependas. Uh, now I um, would like to say that we have invited uh, Dr. Bolin Hazurika, sir, retired head of the Department of Political Science, Sebi College, Juhat, and current president of All Assam Political Science Association uh, to inaugurate the session. Now I request Dr. Bolin Hazurika, sir, uh, to deliver his inaugural speech. Hazurika, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, respected organizers of this uh, national webinar, principal of uh, Dudnoy College, head and uh, staff of the Department of Political Science, Dudnoy College, uh, the officials and members of the Center of Ethnic Studies and Research, Professor J. Dangal, head of the Department of Political Science, Mizoram University, who will be the uh, chief speaker of this uh, session and an old friend of mine and uh, the participants of this webinar. At the outset, I congratulate you all for a particular reason. The reason is that you have selected a very, very relevant topic for discussion today. This is relevant for so many reasons. One only two days short of the current year, that is on 5th August 2019, Parliament of India took a major decision for abrogation of Article 370 
and also Article 35A from the constitution, from our constitution. Both these articles were connected with the existence of then state of Jammu and Kashmir. By this action, the parliament decided to establish two union territories in place of the old state of Jammu and Kashmir. It is of high importance for all of us to know what exactly is happening in that place after abrogation of Article 370 and also 35A. And this is the responsibility of educational institutions as well as social civil society groups to let us know, to let the society know what is going on there, what is the real picture, what is going on there in the earlier state of Jammu and Kashmir and present Jammu and Kashmir. So the, uh, I think that uh, from that point of view, both these organizations, the political science department of uh, Durnoy College and the other organizations, that is Ethnic Studies and Research, Center for Ethnic Studies and Research, they deserve special thanks. Thank you for, the select, for selecting such an important topic for discussion. As I mentioned earlier, on 5th August 2019, the center stripped off the special status from Jammu and Kashmir and in its place, two union territories were established. One is Jammu and Kashmir and the other is Ladakh. Article 35A empowered the former state of Jammu and Kashmir to define who will be the permanent resident of the earlier state and what will be their rights, what will be their uh, duties, etc., and etc. Along, uh, along with Article 370 and Article 35. Uh, Article 35A is also now repealed by the Parliament of India. The repeal of these two articles in Jammu and Kashmir was followed by so many activities, but the first and foremost and immediate activity was the scrapping of internet facility from all the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And the heavy restrictions that was imposed upon the movement of the uh, people, general people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, as a result of the abrogation of Article 370, all the political leaders, including the three chief ministers of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, namely Farooq Abdullah, Mehbooba Mufti, and Omar Abdullah, were immediately placed under house arrest, house arrest under Public Security Act. While Farooq Abdullah and Omar Abdullah are now released from their house arrest, Mehbooba Mufti is still under confinement. A distinct change can be noticed in the structure of employees of Jammu and Kashmir present Jammu and Kashmir that has occurred in the last, last year. As you know, 97% of the people of that region were Muslim and are Muslim. Presently also 97% of the whole population are Muslim. Obviously, the majority of the employees in the administration were Muslim. But now there is a very minute number of Muslims in the state administration, particularly in the key post. Our learned participants will kindly pay an eye on this issue and discuss accordingly. No discussion on Kashmir will be complete without two important dimensions. Both these, the name, the name of both these dimensions starts with the alphabet T. One is tourism and the other is terrorism. Tourist and uh, terrorist, these two, 
it, where where these two are the primary feature of the life of the Kashmiri people and the Kashmiri state. Now, Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir Union territories. It is unfortunate that the number of tourists in Kashmir has reduced by 86% in August, December 2019. It is reducing because of the trouble situation going on there. But it is a matter of relief that the number of terrorists and their activities are also decreasing. <clears throat> in a, uh, that, is, that is also decreasing in the last year. A report has stated that the number of Kashmiri youth joining terrorist group has dropped more than 40%. This is a good news for us. And another good news is that on the 35, 35 security, 35 security personnel have been killed since January 1 in this period compared to 75 in the last year in this very same period. Therefore, I think some good news is are waiting for us and in the days to days which will be coming in future, we will be getting more and more good news. It is natural that in a vibrant democracy like India, no government decision will go unchallenged. However good it may be, it will be challenged by one organization or other, one party or the other, one social organization or the other. Take the case of the local political parties of Kashmir. The local political parties have openly criticized central government's decision of abrogation of Article 370. They warned of serious consequences to the central government for this action. Again, take the case of one social science, I mean, civil society group. The social organization called Reconciliation, Relief and Rehabilitation. This is the name of the group. This is constituted primarily of the Kashmiri Brahmins. It is surprising to know that this organization has demanded restoration of Article 370 again in Jammu and Kashmir. However, most of the Hindus displaced from Kashmir have supported the repeal of Article 370. So under such circumstances of multiple dimensions, I hope this webinar will fruitfully discuss the subject and throw sufficient light on the latest happening of Jammu and Kashmir. With these few words, I declare that the webinar is now inaugurated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hazarika, sir. Uh, your speech has really covered the entire prospects of our team. And I think our participants are now more encouraged uh, to buy your speech for the upcoming discussions of the program. Thank you, Hazarika sir, once again. Uh, now I request Dr. Prasanta Sharma, head of the Department of Political Science, Dudnoy College, to deliver his keynote speech. Uh, Dr. Sharma, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Respected Principal Dugnai College, Dr. Lolit Chandra Ravasar, respected inaugurator of this today of uh, today's webinar, Dr. Bolin Hajarika sir, respected resource person of today's webinar, Professor J. Dongal sir. Uh, head of the department, Department of Political Science, Mizoram University, respected office bearers of CESR, and my departmental colleagues, as well as the participants of the webinar. Now I am going to present the keynote speech of today's webinar, the abrogation of Article 370 and contemporary Kashmir. Article 370 of the Indian Constitution is an article that gave autonomous status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir 
the article is a part of part 21 of the constitution which deals with temporary transitional and special provisions it provided that the only articles of the indian constitution that would apply to the state of jammu and kashmir were article 1 and article 370 it forms the basis of the special status uh, accorded to the jammu and kashmir and also provides for a separate constitution for the state. Article 370 restricted Indian parliament to make any laws for the state and it could only preside over the subjects, namely defense, external affairs and communication. That is the subjects that were in the instrument of accession. Laws related to union and concurrent list in Jammu and Kashmir could be passed only after consultation with the state government. Associated with Article 370 is Article 35A, which was incorporated into the Constitution in the year 1954 by a presidential order issued under Article 370, Clause 1D of the Constitution. Article 35A of the Indian Constitution gives the Jammu and Kashmir legislature the power to define permanent residents of the state and confer on them special rights and privileges in public sector jobs, acquisition of property in the state, scholarships and other public aid and welfare. The provision mandates that no act of the legislature coming under it can be challenged for violating the constitution or any other law of the land. On August 5, 2019, ending Jammu and Kashmir's special status in the Indian Union, President of India in concurrence with the Jammu and Kashmir government promulgated constitution that is application to Jammu and Kashmir order 2019, which states that provisions of the Indian constitution are applicable in the state. This effectively means that all the provisions that form the basis of a separate constitution for Jammu and Kashmir were abrogated. With this article 35A was also scrapped automatically. Similarly, all central laws, treaties, etc. have been extended to the state. Therefore, Although Article 370 remains in the statute, the special provisions conferred by it stand abrogated. Another act, Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019 was passed by the parliament, which reorganized the erstwhile Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories, namely Jammu and Kashmir with a legislature and Ladakh without a legislature. These have brought about fundamental changes in the Indian polity. So, so provisions like Article 360, that is the financial emergency, RTI, RTE, etc., that were previously not applicable here have been made available after this. Similarly, provisions like dual citizenship for citizens of Jammu and Kashmir, separate flag, etc., that were exclusively applicable for citizens of Jammu and Kashmir have been repealed. I hope that our resource person, Professor Dongal Sir, will enlighten us about this uh, very pertinent issue. Now, I would like to hand it over to Bandita to carry forward the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, um, for your wonderful speech. Um, with this, we come to the end of the inaugural session. Now, I would like to introduce our resource person. Uh, today, we have with us Professor Jongkhangam um, Dongels, Professor of the Department of Political Science, Mizoram University. Uh, Professor Dongels' area of interest are six schedule of the Constitution of India, Autonomous District Council and Local Government, Government and Politics in Northeast India, Indian Government and Politics and the Constitution of India. He is now working as the Director of IQSC Mizoram University. Professor Dongel has been engaged in various research works and published lots of research articles 
in various national and international reputed journals. He is also engaged with major research projects funded by ICSSR, UGC, etc. Professor Dongyal has supervised the number of PhD and MPhil scholars and ev evaluated PhD thesis and MPhil dissertations from different universities. I am very glad to inform you all that recently Professor Dongyal has been selected for Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship to do research and study in the University of Cincinnati, Ohio, United States of America. The fellowship was approved to start from August 2020, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, it had to be postponed till April 2021. I welcome Professor Dongel Sir to our webinar. Now, I would like to request Dongel Sir to take over the platform and to start his presentation. Sir. Dongel Sir. Mm, yeah. You can can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Thank you, Bonjita, for the time. And at the outset, yes, I would like to express my thanks and gratitude to uh, Dr. Dependas, Bonjita, then head of department, uh, principal of the college, and my good friend and president of Assam Political Science Association, Dr. Bolin Hazarika. We have been met for the past four years, and I'm thankful that we are meeting through this webinar today. And as has been announced today, the topic of discussion will be abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution of India and contemporary Kashmir issue. So let me try to share the screen. Uh, you can share your screen. Just go to the share tab, share screen. Right. Hmm. Can you view the screen, Bonjita? No, sir. Uh, you first click on the share screen tab. Share screen. Yes, sir. In the Zoom meeting. Yeah, I think I have already. In the below. Yes, sir. You right. Share screen, the green color tip in the Zoom platform. Is it slide show? No, sir. You open the Zoom platform, then you click on the share screen. Can you see the button? Yeah, yeah, I, I can see. You click on share screen, then you open the file. Microphone is off. Sir. Okay, is it audible? Yes, it is. Now you go to the slide share button below. No, sir. Uh, 
below in the right corner, you have the slide share button. Slide share. Yes. Uh, next one. Yes. Good. Yes, sir. This visible. Is it all right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So the topic of discussion for today is the abrogation of Article 370 and contemporary Kashmir issue. And here, without going back to the historical background, the present Kashmir issue cannot be discussed. So we have to go a little bit to the historical background. And yes, we know this special provision of Jammu and Kashmir on the basis of Article 370 has created a lot of hue and cry. And in fact, this article was the most sensitive political issue in Indian political system. And this very article, before its deletion from the Constitution of India, differentiated the governance of the then state of Jammu and Kashmir from other states of India. And the Bharatiya Janata Party, since its establishment from 1980, advocated some important agenda, like abolition of special status of Jammu and Kashmir, uniform civil code, then the other one, construction of Ram Temple in Ayodhya. And why? Abolition of Article 370 has been emphasized by the BJP. So in the clarification of the Bharatiya Janata Party, it says that it wants to abrogate Article 370 to equalize Jammu and Kashmir with other states of India. And this Article 370 had certain historical background and political significance. And like this Article 370, for some Northeastern states, particularly in the tribal area, Article 371 also has been enacted by the parliament. Then what was the political status of Jammu and Kashmir? So at the time when Constituent Assembly of India was form during that time, Jammu and Kashmir was a princely state. So it was a princely state at that time. Due to that, Jammu and Kashmir was not part of the Constituent Assembly of India, and it was not part of the Union of India at that time. And despite being not part of the Constituent Assembly, Article 370 of the Constitution of India was provided for the then state of Jammu and Kashmir, when it became, when it was integrated into the Union of India. And in fact, this Article 370 was only a temporary provision. So we all should know that this Article 370 was not a permanent provision. It was a temporary provision. And this Article 370 provided special status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir till its abolition. And Article 370 enabled the uniqueness of Jammu and Kashmir from other states of India. And what was Jammu and Kashmir before bifurcation? So before bifurcation of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, what were Jammu and Kashmir? So, Jammu and Kashmir comprise of Jammu and Kashmir Valley and Ladakh. And besides this Jammu, Kashmir Valley and Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir also politically claim up till now, Pakistan administered Kashmir or Pak occupied Kashmir. But the Pakistani government named it as Azad Kashmir free Kashmir. And other than that, Chinese administ administer region of Aksai Chin and Trans-Karakoram Trek were also there. So 
Pakistan occupied Kashmir and these Chinese administer also have been claimed by India. And in the first half of the first uh, millennium, Kashmir region became an important center of Hinduism and after that Buddhism. Then in the ninth century, Saivism began and Saivism came to rose up in Jammu and Kashmir. And after that, Islamization of Kashmir took place from 13th to 15th century AD. And this Islamization led to decline of Saivism in Kashmir. Then in 1339, Sa Mil became the first Muslim ruler of Kashmir. And for the next five centuries, Kashmir was under the domain of the Muslim monarch. Then Mughal Empire ruled Kashmir from 1586 until 1751. And after that, Kashmir was under the rule of Afghan Durrani from 1747 till 1819. And in 1819, the great Maharaja Ranjit Singh annexed Kashmir and gave it under the rule of Sikh kingdom. And in 1846, after the defeat of the Sikh kingdom in the first Anglo-Sikh war by the British, under the Treaty of Amritsar, this Kashmir passed over to Raja of Jammu Gulab Singh. So Gulab Singh became the new ruler of Kashmir. And Gulab Singh was succeeded by his son Ranjit Singh. And till independence of India, Dogra dynasty continued to rule Kashmir. Ranbir Singh's grandson, Hari Singh, who ascended the throne of Kashmir in 1925, was the, the last reigning monarch of Kashmir. He ruled till 1947. Then during that time, India was partitioned into two newly independent dominion, Union of India and the Dominion of Pakistan. And during that time, there were over 600 princely states in undivided India. When I mean undivided India, that undivided India comprised of the present India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. So in whole undivided India, there were over 600 princely states. And British Indian states, they became either part of India or Pakistan. But the princely states were given three options. The three options were they could remain independent. They could join India or they could join Pakistan. So, Three options were given to the princely states. And Kashmir was among the princely states, which was provided with the provision of these three options. And in 1947, the population ratio in Kashmir was 77% Muslim and 20% Hindus. But the Maharaja, the ruler of the province was, the ruler of the kingdom was Hindu. And Maharaja, he wanted to maintain equidistance between India and Pakistan in order to maintain sovereignty. He wanted to be independent. He wanted Jammu and Kashmir to be independent because he would like to appease both his Hindu subjects and the Muslim subjects. So to keep good terms with both communities of his subjects, Maharaja preferred to be independent. And Maharaja, he, avoid, he avoided making hurried decision. So at first, the Maharaja of Kashmir, Hari Singh, he signed a standstill agreement with Pakistan. And what was the focus of this standstill agreement? Jammu and Kashmir will continue to maintain trade travel, communication, and other similar service between Pakistan and Jammu and Kashmir. That means 
Jammu and Kashmir would continue to maintain relationship with Pakistan with regard to trade, travel, communication, and other services. But that's why the main aim of Maharaja was to give good terms with both India and Pakistan and to remain independent. But in October 1947, unexpected things happened. So what happened? Huge riots took place in Jammu in October 1947. And after that, Pashtuns tribesmen from Pakistan Northwest Frontier Province, backed by Pakistan regular armies, invaded Kashmir. They invaded Kashmir, and the king of Kashmir was taken by, by surprise. So those Pashtun tribesmen and Pakistan regular army, they engaged in looting and killing along the way. And the main aim of the attacking party was to frighten Maharaja Hari Singh into submission so that Pakistan should be part of, in, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, sorry, should be part of Pakistan. But instead of being caught down, Maharaja Hari Singh appealed to the government of India for assistance. But the then Governor General of India at that time, Lord Mountbatten, he laid only one condition that on, only on one condition he could agree to the demand to the appeal of the Maharaja. So if Maharaja agreed that Jammu and Kashmir should be part of India, should accede to India, only then India could help Jammu and Kashmir. So that was the condition laid down by Lord Mountbatten. And that's why as that condition was laid down by Governor General, Maharaja Hari Singh had no option. So he signed instrument of accession with government of India on 26 October, 1947. And after that, after his signing of the instrument of accession, Indian force enter Kashmir. And they drove away Pakistani sponsored irregulars and Pakistan army from the region of Kashmir, which they occupied. And at that time, India accepted the accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India, but it was regarded as temporary. So when fighting was going on, when gun battle was going on between Indian army and Pashtun tribesmen and Pakistan, backed by Pakistan regular army. So that during, during that time, commander of the Indian army in Kashmir, he requested Prime Minister Nehru to give him just four days. If he was given four days, then within four days, all the Pakistani army and Pashtun tribesmen who occupied some portion of Kashmir could be repulsed back. That's why even if you have to sign ceasefire or any agreement with any authority, please wait us four days. Please give us four days time so that all uh, those intruders could be pushed back. But on that day itself, when the commander of Indian army in Kashmir requested Prime Minister Nehru, Prime Minister Nehru signed ceasefire agreement. And at the time when ceasefire agreement was signed, one third of Jammu and Kashmir was still occupied by Pashtun tribesmen and Pakistan regular army. That's why a ceasefire agreement was signed already. Indian forces could not move forward. And due to that, one third of Jammu and Kashmir remain with Pakistan, which India today call it Pakistan occupied Kashmir or POK, but Pakistan government call that territory as free Kashmir or Azad Kashmir. That's why on this very point, Kashmir is regarded as Nehru's Waterloo. That's why diplomats, administrators, and many writers, they describe Jammu and Kashmir as Nehru's Waterloo because of losing the territory and because of not driving out Pakistani irregular and regular army from Jammu and Kashmir at the time. Then when Kashmir acceded to India, Kashmiri leader and 
leader of the National Conference Party, Sheep Abdullah. He also endorsed the accession, but he said that this would be temporary and final decisions should be taken by the people of the state. And after that, Sheikh Abdullah was appointed as head of the emergency administration. And he was designated as prime minister of Jammu and Kashmir by the Maharaja. Sheikh Abdullah also had the vision of sovereign Kashmir like Maharaja Hari Singh. And the moment Maharaja Hari Singh signed instrument of accession, and then Kashmir became part of the territory of India, Pakistan government contested this accession. So Pakistan government claimed that this accession was not legal. It was fraudulent and Maharaja acted under strong pressure from government of India. And Pakistan government also claimed that Maharaja had already signed standstill agreement with Pakistan, which was still in force. That's why signing another agreement with government of India and Jammu and Kashmir becoming part of India, it was not legal. It was not proper. So that was the claim of Jammu, uh, Pakistan government. Then what about this Article 370? As I've said, Article 370, it was only temporary provision. So it was only temporary provision. That's why uh, Jammu and Kashmir could be categorized as Part B state. The provision for this Part B state was incorporated in Article 238 of the Constitution of India, but this very provision was deleted from the Constitution by Constitution, Constitution 7 Amendment Act of 1956. So then, with regard to this Jammu and Kashmir, Parliament, before the abolition of Article 370, Indian Parliament had only little option with regard to Jammu and Kashmir. So power of Parliament is shown in seven schedule. Like in seven schedule, we are aware that there are three lists, union lists, the lists or subjects which belong to union government. Then state lease, the lease which belong to the state government. Then concurrent lease means the subjects or departments or lease which can be touched both by the union government and the state government. But in case with regard to this concurrent lease, if both the union and the state touch this lease, then union government will be the upper hand. But with regard to this Jammu and Kashmir, prior to the abrogation of Article 370, only the union lease is applicable. Then, other than that, so with regard to state lease, that's why most of the power of the parliament could not extend. As I've said, parliament had jurisdiction only in the union list. That's why, and this article 370 also has provided a provision for Jammu and Kashmir to form its own constituent assembly. And that constituent assembly should frame the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. So with regard to this Jammu and Kashmir, government of the state means the person for the time being recognized by the president is Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. And this Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, acting on the advice of the Council of Ministers. And in this regard, Maharaja made a proclamation on the fifth day of March, 1948. So, the only two articles of the Constitution of India, which were applicable in their own force to the state of Jammu and Kashmir were Article 1 and Article 370. That's why 
in pursuance of the above provision of the constitution, the president of India made the constitution applicable or application to Jammu and Kashmir older 1950. Then after this notification was issued by the president of India, the union parliament was competent to make laws for Jammu and Kashmir relating to defense, foreign affairs and communication. So this legislation also can be made only by the parliament only after notification to this effect was issued by the president of India. Then there was an agreement between government of India and the state of Jammu and Kashmir in June 1952. So in that agreement on which subjects union should have jurisdiction over the state uh, was decided. But final should be after the enactment of the cons constitution of Jammu and Kashmir by the Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly. Then in 1954, the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir properly ratified accession of Jammu and Kashmir to India. Then the people of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, they elected a sovereign constituent assembly and this sovereign constituent assembly met for the first time on October 31st, 1951. Then the provision how the three organs of government of Jammu and Kashmir, executive, legislature and judiciary should function, should be as per the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, which should be framed and which should be prepared by the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. And the first official act of the Constituent Assembly of the state of Jammu and Kashmir was to put an end to hereditary rule of the Maharaya. In fact, Maharaya invited Sheikh Abdullah to be the leader of government, head of government. But the first target of Sheikh Abdullah was abolition of monarchy and putting the rule of Dogra dynasty to an end. Then Sheikh Abdullah cabinet was not satisfied with anything other than abdication of the throne by Maharaja Hari Singh. That's why as the government of Jammu and Kashmir pressurized the Maharaja to abdicate the throne and to put an end to hereditary rule of the Dogra dynasty. In June 1949, Maharaja Hari Singh abdicated the throne in favor of his son, Jubras Karan Singh. And after his, he abdicated the throne, Maharaja Hari Singh he left Kashmir and he stayed in Mumbai and he, he could not forget the manner how he was treated and how he abdicated his throne. So he never returned to Jammu and Kashmir. Then Yuvras Karan Singh, afterwards he was elected by the Constituent Assembly of the state as elected head of state on 31st October 1951. And he was designated as Saldar e Riyasad. In such a way, the princely rule of the state of Jammu and Kashmir came to an end and the state began to have an elected head of state. So the government of India also accepted this position by making a declaration. The president under article 370 clause three of the constitution 15 November 1952 made a declaration to what proposed by the state government. And with regard to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, government of the state of Jammu and Kashmir shall mean Sadar e Riyasat of Jammu and Kashmir acting on the advice of the council of the state. So a bit different from other state. In other state, it should be governor acting on the advice of the council of minister. Then, the drafting committee of 
the Pakistan Constituent uh, Sorry, Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly prepared presented the draft, and for that. in the then state of Jammu and Kashmir. So this constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, it was a legal document and which established the framework of government for the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And this constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, as I've said, it became effective with effect from 26 January, 1957. It was adopted on 17 November 1956 and became effective from 26 January 1957. So the effective date, day, it was same as the Constitution of India, 26 January. And this Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir had 158 articles, 13 parts and seven shadows. And till 2002, the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was amended 29 times. And with regard to any amendment of the constitution of India, this amendment of the constitution of India shall not extend to Jammu and Kashmir unless it was extended by order of the president of India under article 371. And what is the content of this Jammu and Kashmir constitution? The constitution declares that the state of Jammu and Kashmir to be integral part of Union of India. And what was the, what is the territory of Jammu and Kashmir? The territory of the Jammu and Kashmir will comprise all the territory which became part of Jammu and Kashmir on 15 August 1947. So with those ter territory, which were under the rule of Mahaya, Maharaja Hari Singh on 15 August 1947, which means the present Azad Kashmir or Pak occupied Kashmir and some part of Kashmir, which were under China and all those undivided Kashmir was claimed or have been claimed as the territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Yeah, so this is mentioned in the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. That's why undivided Jammu and Kashmir stood for territories of present Jammu and Kashmir, Ladakh and Azad Kashmir or Pak occupied Kashmir. That's why executive and legislative power of the state will extend to all matter except those with respect to which parliament has power to make law for the state under the constitution of India. And the legislature of the state of Jammu and Kashmir comprise of two houses, legislative assembly and legislative council. Then this legislative assembly in the initial stage was supposed to be comprised of 100 members. And out of these 100 members, 100 seats 24 seats should be reserved for Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So 24 seats have been reserved for Pakistan occupied Kashmir on the expectation that the moment Pakistan occupied Kashmir become part of unified Kashmir, then 24 seats should be represented by them. But by 20th amendment of 1988, the number of seats in legislative assembly increased to 111 and even then, 24 seats were still reserved for Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And this constitution of Jammu and Kashmir can be amended by introducing bill in the legislative assembly and it should be passed in both houses of 
the state legislature by majority of not less than two thirds of the total membership of the house. So with regard to this Jammu and Kashmir, jurisdiction of parliament extend with regard to those in the union list and the concurrent list, Article 246. And in, with regard to concurrent list also, most of the time power is with the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then the power to legislate with respect to preventive detention in the state of Jammu and Kashmir under Article 22, Clause 7, it only belong to the state legislature. Then as per the provision, parliament cannot make law with regard to alteration of the name or territories of the state, then signing international treaty or agreement affecting the then state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then as per the earlier provision, president cannot declare emergency under Article 352 and Article 360 of the Constitution of India. In such a way, the elsewhile state of Jammu and Kashmir had more still right, state rights than other states. And in the union list, uh, I mean in seven schedule, there, there were three lists, which there are three lists which I've already mentioned, union list, state list, and concurrent list. But Indian constitution is the most detailed and the most extensive constitution of the world. But every minor details cannot be written in the constitution. Even if the constitution is written so much in detail, there may be few provision or few subjects which will be missing. So those missing subjects, which are not highlighted in any of the three lists, union lists, state lists, and concurrent lists, are term as residuary powers. So with regard to these residuary powers, for other states, these residuary powers belong to parliament. But with regard to the state of the elsewhile, Jammu and Kashmir, residuary powers belong to the state. Then part four of the Constitution of India, directive principles of state's policy and part four A, fundamental duties of the Constitution of India are not applicable in the elsewhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then Jammu and Kashmir also has its own flag as provided in article 144 of the state constitution and part six of the Indian Constitution, Article 152 to 237, which concern with governance of state, these whole parts from Article 152 to 237 are not applicable in the then Jammu and Kashmir. And as a result of Jammu and Kashmir Constitution 6 Amendment Act 1956, the designation Sadr E. Rizasat was changed into governor. And the designation, prime minister also changed into chief minister. That's why Jammu and, since then, Jammu and Kashmir had no longer, no, no longer had prime minister, but chief minister. Jammu and Kashmir no longer had Sadr E. Rizasat, but governor. And Karan Singh, who became the Sadr E. Rizasat after abdication of Trump by his father, he also became the first governor of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And one interesting thing about this Jammu and Kashmir uh, current thing was that by dean of being governor of Jammu and Kashmir, he was chancellor of Kashmir University. And he wrote in his autobiography that, quote, I was the one who signed my own BS certificate. So, because during that time, he studied BA under affiliated college in Kashmir University. But by the end of being governor of the state, he was also chancellor of Kashmir University. And he graduated from Kashmir University and he signed his own BS certificate. So this is also uh, a record creating incidents. So Chancellor who signed his own BS certificate. So this is with regard to currency. And 
Article 191F and Article 31-2, Fundamental Rights of the Constitution of India. So these two rights were not applicable in Jammu and Kashmir. That means right to property was abolished from Constitution of India, as we know. But it was not abolished in the then Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir. So Jammu and Kashmir had many other facilities, privileges, and autonomy, which was not enjoyed by other states of India. And over and above that, fifth schedule to the Constitution of India pertaining to administration and governance of scheduled areas under Article 244 Clause 1, and six schedule pertaining to governance of scheduled tribes under Article 244 Clause 2. These two important schedules were not applicable in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Then we shall come to abolition of Article 370. So people of Jammu and Kashmir are still interested in preservation of Article 370. But from before, with regard to this Article 370, there were many critical comments from right-wing political parties. And in Jammu and Kashmir, many secessionist groups are still launching pro-Pakistani campaign and anti-India feeling. So many secessionist groups, both overground and underground, are functioning actively in Jammu and Kashmir even today. As I've said, abolition of Article 370 was the main political slogan of the BJP since its establishment. But earlier, during the 13 days government of BJP in 1996, one year government of BJP in 1998, and five years government of BJP or NDA1 from 1999 to 2004, this article has not been mentioned at all. And this article has not been was not raised at all. It may be due to lack of number in parliament. And it was not touched, even the earlier NDA2 government in the previous term of Prime Minister Narendra Modi also, this article was not mentioned at all. So many, they believe that BJP has given up its important slogan, but the party is not giving, giving up the important slogan. In this regard, the BJP calculated its move wisely and Amit Shah did a surgical strike when it was not expected. How? Because first, triple talak was enacted. And with the enactment of triple talak, there was mixed reaction among the Muslim community between the Muslim men and women. The Muslim women welcome it, but Muslim, Muslim women welcome it, but Muslim men, they oppose to the nail. So triple talaq was introduced in the Lok Sabha on 21st June 2019 by Ravi Sankar Prasa, Minister of Law and Justice. And it was passed, adopted on 25th July 2019 in the Lok Sabha. Then it was passed in the Rai Sabha on 30 July 2019. And since then, triple talaq became illegal and unconstitutional. Before that, if any Muslim man pronounced talaq three times, then he can divorce his wife. It was said that some Muslim man divorced his wife from distant through SMS and phone also. But I know I don't know whether it's real or not. Whatever be the case, since the enactment of this triple talaq bill by parliament. Then triple talaq became illegal and anyone who violated this triple talaq enactment 
can be imprisoned for a period of three years. And over and above that, Muslim women against whom talaq is declared can now get subsistence allowance for herself and her children from her husband. And she is also entitled to seek custody of her minor children. So all Muslim women support the enactment, but Muslim men are deadly against it. So at the time when opinion of Muslim population was divided and triple talak issue dominated the national media. So during that, at that juncture, around one lakh army personnel were stationed in Jammu and Kashmir. And stationing of around one lakh army personnel in Jammu and Kashmir were really apprehended. And many people, they were really apprehensive of this intention of the government. But during that time, the BJP government calculated its move, its move wisely. And Amit Shah, Home Minister, did a well calculated move when it was not expected. So as the enactment of triple talak created mixed reaction among Muslim men and Muslim women throughout the country, Amir Sa surprised the nation by fulfilling long time desire of the BJP. As I've said, almost one lakh army personnel were stationed in Jammu and Kashmir, and preparation was secretly accomplished for abrogation of Article 370. So at the time when the whole nation was swayed by triple talak enactment, triple talak reaction, Amit Sa, Honorable Home Minister, did a surgical strike by introducing Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Bill 2019 in the Sabha on 15 August 2019 and was passed on the same day. The Home Minister introduced the bill only after the presidential order or Article 370 was issued. And this bill provides for reorganization of the elsewhile state of Jammu and Kashmir into Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Union Territory of Ladakh. Then the bill was also passed in the Lok Sabha on 6 August 2019. And as per the provision of the legislation, Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir will have legislature, but Union Territory of Ladakh will not have legislature. Then Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir will now be under Lieutenant Governor and Ladakh will be under Administrator. And both this Lieutenant Governor and Administrator will govern the respective Union Territory in the name of the President of India because they are already Union Territory. Then this Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir will have 107 seats in Legislative Assembly and out of these 107 seats, like the previous provision, 24 seats will still be reserved for Pakistan occupied Kashmir. And earlier, the term of Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly was six years, but now the term will be equalized with other states. It will be five years term now. And two seats in the Legislative Assembly will be reserved for women if they are not adequately represented. And those nominated seats will be appointed. Nomination will be done by the Lieutenant Governor of the state. Then the High Court of elsewhile Jammu and Kashmir will be common High Court for Union territories of Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir. And Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir will have Advocate General to provide legal advice to government of the Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory and Legislative Council of the State of Jammu and Kashmir was abolished by the new legislation. So after bifurcation of the elsewhere state into two Union Territories, 106 central law 
which are not applicable in the elsewhere state before will now be applicable in the two union territories. Then police and law and order of the UT will be the responsibility of the union territory like other union territory. So it will be under now union government. Then what did Home Minister Amit Shah say? Home Minister Amit Shah said that this has been done to contain terrorism and to extend the, benef the benefit of development to all people of the state, which was restricted earlier to two or three families. So that was the clar clarification of the Home Minister. That's why Jammu and Kashmir, which was earlier, the elsewhere Jammu and Kashmir, which was earlier the most powerful state with its own constitution, with its own flag, with autonomous power is now degraded from highest status to lower status of provincial unit, that is union territory in Indian Union. Earlier it enjoyed even residuary powers, but now both UT will be under strict supervision of the union government. And now all parts of the constitution of India are applicable in the two UTs like other union territories. And as I've said, six year term, it is now reduced to five years term. There is no longer separate flag, separate constitution. There is no longer special status. That's why Kashmir, which enjoy the highest status now is equalized with other union territories. It does not reach even the level of the normal state. Then what is the contemporary status as a result of abrogation of this Article 370? After abrogation of Article 370, the else file state of Jammu and Kashmir is now bifurcated into two union territories. Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and union territory of Ladakh. And so far as the administration of Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, Jammu remain as the winter capital of Jammu and Kashmir and Srinagar will continue to be the summer capital of Jammu and Kashmir. And with regard to Ladakh Union Territory, Kargil will be the capital of Ladakh Union Territory. And now this Jammu and Kashmir as Union Territory will be administered in the name of the President of India by Lieutenant Governor. And now Girish Chandra Mulmu is the Lieutenant Governor of Jammu and Kashmir. And as I've said, with regard to Ladakh, this Ladakh will be administered by administrator in the name of the President of India. And Radha Krishna Mathur is now the administrator of Ladakh. So Jammu and Kashmir is supposed to have legislature, but Ladakh will not have legislature. And up till now, Noel Mercy does not exactly return in the two union territories of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. Terrorism, terrorism from across the border still disturbs the two UTs, particularly Jammu and Kashmir UT. So some prominent politicians of the elsewhere state of Jammu and Kashmir are still kept under house arrest. So this is the ongoing situation. And due to intensification of terrorist activities from across the border, internet connection also cannot function normally. And this also hamper the functioning of the citizens to do normal works. Then from time to time, we may know broadcasting national media and national paper, the killing of serpents, and Kashmir, this has been regular news item with regard to Jammu and Kashmir. And now there is proposal for enforcement of domicile law. So what is mean by this domicile law? This domicile law is expected to pave way for return of many Kashmiri pandits who fled Jammu and Kashmir due to terrorist activities. 
in fact domicile law was enacted domicile law was arranged was prepared for return of kashmiri pandits who fled their homeland and administration or governing authority of union territory of jammu and kashmir claims that there will be no more second class citizens in jammu and kashmir all citizens will be equal now all citizens will be equalized that that is the claim of the present administration and so election for this legislative assembly of jammu and kashmir cannot be conducted up till now and delimitation is still in the process and with regard to this ongoing delimitation those who watch the national media and national paper you may be aware of it so there is some charges between the governor lieutenant governor and election commission of india so lieutenant governor of jammu and kashmir gc mulmu he told the pressman that till the completion of the process of delimitation it may not be appropriate to conduct legislative assembly election in jammu and kashmir but in that regard what did the election commission of india say so the responsibility for proposing fixing or taking final decision with regard to election any election that is the responsibility of the election commission of india not the lieutenant governor so in such a way uh, some issue is going on then there are also charges and counter charges between political parties and administration of jammu and kashmir and president of the national conference amal abdullah he filed petition in the supreme court challenging the abrogation of article 370 but with regard to this the legislation which was which has been enacted by the competent legislature so what the supreme court will do in this regard we have to wait and watch and on the other hand government of pakistan tries to internationalize the issue and terrorist groups are still intensifying terrorist activities to disturb the normal administration so this is the ongoing trend in jammu and kashmir so in the midst of all these ongoing administrative problems terrorist disturbances the government of pakistan announces the confirmation of pakistan highest civilian award to kashmiri separatist leader gilani and this is one new issue with regard to jammu and kashmir contemporary issue now so the one who has been regarded and the the person who is always scrutinized and who is in the watch list of the government of india has been conferred highest civilian award by the neighboring country so is is issue is also going on in this regard that's why now the administration of the union territory of jammu and kashmir it can be say still in transitional stage because elected government is not yet formed in jammu and kashmir and governing authority in jammu and kashmir tries all possible efforts to restore normalcy in the union territory and to conduct election of the legislative assembly of the ut uh, with regard to jammu and kashmir that's why the administration tries its level best so how far it is successful and how far it can be achieved we have to wait and watch with regard to this ladakh union territory the administration can be managed to some extent by the administrator under the supervision of the union government so the problem still lies with jammu and kashmir and improvement of the situation can be expected expected after the conduct of assembly election so as we know jammu and kashmir is as old problem because jammu and kashmir issue was the main issue between india and pakistan since independence so this many decades problem should not be expected to be solved overnight that is with regard to this jammu and kashmir okay we'll come to the concluding remark yes we know jammu and kashmir has unique historical background which necessitated 
Article 370s. Then we know the status of Jammu and Kashmir in pre-colonial era, then colonial era. And the else while Article 370 was totally different from other provisions of the Constitution of India because it contained special status, which were not accorded to other states of India. But abolition of Article 370 and bifurcation of the state, elsewhile state of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories now equalize the elsewhile special status states with other states and union territories of India. So this Article 370 happened to be Pandora box from the time it was inserted in the constitution of India. And it is still a problematic issue if even after abolition. And two UTs of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, they are set up with administrators to govern the territory on behalf of the president of India. As I've said, Lieutenant Governor in the case of Jammu and Kashmir and administrator in the case of Ladakh. So those two administrators, they govern the two UT on behalf of the president of India. So at this juncture, election cannot be conducted yet, but preparation is still going on. And as I've said, this Kashmir issue, it is uh, about seven decades old problem. So it should not be expected to be solved overnight. Article 370 was already abrogated from the constitution of India. It is no longer part of the constitution of India and it is now history, but the issue left by Article 370 is still alive. And it is going to be the most talk about political issue in academic circle, in political circle, and even in the days to come. And on the other hand, the dynamic nature of the constitution of India can be said to be practically proved in the issue of this Article 370. So this shows that Indian constitution is a dynamic constitution. Indian constitution is a changing constitution and Indian constitution can be changed with the coming of time. So this is how about article 370, the historical background of Jammu and Kashmir, the political history, how Jammu and Kashmir became part of India, how article 370 was inserted in the constitution of India and how it is abolished and what issues have been left by this article 370. Okay, thank you all for your patience. Now, let me hand over to our host. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Gyalpur. Uh, thank you for your wonderful speech and presentation. I hope all our participants are highly benefited by your speech and presentation because it is reflected in the chat box. Um, most of the participants, they are writing that it is very wonderful session. It is very informative um, and excellent presentation. Uh, I think all are highly benefited by your speech. Thank you, Professor Dongel, sir. Uh, now, uh, we have some questions in our chat box. Uh, some participants have asked. I, would like to read out a question on okay. behalf of them. Yes, sir. Uh, one participant, he did not mention his name. Uh, he asked that some anti-Indian activities, harassment by the central government itself, are still facing by the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Is this considered as violation of human rights? He also mentioned about the implementation of APSPA, Armed Forces Special Power Act, in Jammu and Kashmir. He asked it, um, is this considered as violation of human hmm. rights? Okay. Should I attend to the question or is there any other question? There are uh, more questions, but you can answer one by one, sir. Then okay, okay. No. Yeah. yeah, it is a good and reasonable question. As we know, many anti-Indian activities are going on both over ground and underground in Jammu and Kashmir. And even now, 
terrorist activities from across the border is still disturbing the security force and the administration. And due to that, stringent action is required to be taken by the government. And see, yeah, in one way, those in anti-Indian activists, they declare themselves as patriots fighting for their homeland. But in the eyes of the government of India, they are fighting against the sovereignty of India. And, and the question raised is this violation of human rights. And with regard to this human rights, what can I say is that human rights should be objective, human rights should be universal. So by like someone may claim that he is fighting for his freedom, he is fighting for his homeland, but in the midst of that, that one is also committing crime, a human crime. That's why, uh, like the security, so far as the standpoint of the security force is concerned, security force has to protect the sovereignty of India, the unity of India. That's why security force has to exert measures against these anti-Indian activities in order to protect the sovereignty. So in this regard, as I've said, with regard to these human rights, I think these human rights should not be subjective, it should be objective. Like if one talks about, and this is the case with many uh, Northeastern states also, like in case when atrocity has been committed by the security forces, human rights has been raised. But when the same act has been done by the terrorists, is their human rights raised? In such a way as I've said, my answer to this is that human rights should be universal, human rights should be objective, and human rights should be inclusive. If it is exclusive in that regard, it may not be proper and it may not be appropriate to claim human rights. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is from Bonima Talukdar. Uh, she asks, do you think that Delimiting the status of Jammu and Kashmir from the state to union territory will affect the sentiment of the people of this area. She is asking about the sentiment of the people. Yeah, the sentiment of the people will be affected. Absolutely. Because from the time, as has been highlighted in my lecture, Jammu and Kashmir became part of India since 1948, officially since 1948. But, uh, and since that time, and after the instrument of accession was signed by the Maharaja with government of India, Kashmir became part of India. And due to that, special status under Article 370 was provided for these modern seven decades. And they enjoy that status for the past many decades. That's why the people of Jammu and Kashmir may also be habituated with it. But as I've said, this Article 370, it was, it, it was not permanent provision. It was only temporary provision. Temporary provision means it can be extended or it can be abrogated at any time. That's why the people of Jammu and Kashmir, their sentiment may be affected. And due to that, National Conference President Omar Abdullah also now filed petition in the Supreme Court. But what will be the judgment of the Supreme Court in this regard? We have to wait and watch. Absolutely, the people's sentiment will be affected. But as it has been done by the governing authority, and it is enacted by the highest lawmaking body of the country, parliament, then it is already enacted. In fact, the people's sentiment will be absolutely affected. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question is from Reza Rani uh, She asked, what is your opinion on increase or decrease of terrorist activities in relation to abrogation of Article 370? Will the government be in a superposition to control it by this abrogation? Please repeat the question, Mandita. Yes, sir. Uh, what is your opinion 
on increase or decrease of terrorist activities in relation to abrogation of Article 370. Will the government be in a superior position to control it by this abrogation? Yeah. We can compare to pre-abrogation of Article 370 and post-abrogation of Article 370. Even before the abrogation of Article 370, there were many terrorist activities. So when we worked at the national media, national TV channel, national paper, every time attack from across the border, gun battle between the terrorists and security forces, it was reported. That's why uh, in before the abrogation or after abrogation, the level of terrorist activities was the same. And now from special status state, the elsewhere state is now bifurcated into two union territories. And as union territories, the territories are now under the direct rule of the union government, police force, law and order, everything is with the union government now. We all know the provision in the constitution of India. That's why union government has strict control and direct control over the territory now. So with regard to that, dealing with the secessionists, dealing with anti-Indian movements, and dealing with law and order problem, the union government can take everything in its own hand now. That's why it will be more effective. And that's why Home Minister even say, why this has been done so that union government can have effective control upon the territories. Yes, sir. Uh, another question from Heng Xuan Hang. Um, he asks that after boldly abroading Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir by the NDA government, do you think the same government would allow provisions like separate flag and constitution contained in Article 370 be extended to other states like Nagaland? Absolutely no. If it is already abolished in Jammu and Kashmir, and compared to Nagaland, Jammu and Kashmir has some history to claim, some past to claim, and it has been implemented for the past more than seven decades. So if it is taken from Jammu and Kashmir, there is no question of giving to Nagaland. Absolutely no. Anisha Barukel, she asks that, uh, do you think Union territory was successful in eradicate terrorist attacks? What are the initiatives to decrease terrorist activities? So Honor there is a saying yes, that like uh, human being can be prevented or can be defended from animals, from certain other things, but human being cannot be prevented from another human being. So that is the problem being faced in Zemo and Kashmir. And on the other hand, as we know, so the type of terrorism in Zemo and Kashmir, it is not from internal terrorism. It is external terrorism to some extent. Financially, then uh, materially also, those terrorists, they got full support from across the border. Because of that, like after being union territory, union government will have strict control and union government will have uh, strict surveillance over the law and order situation. But uh, to contain this terrorism, force, force cannot control force. Because of that, in order to really solve this terrorism, so, the mindset of the people should be convinced and they should be influenced only if their mind be convinced, only if they are convinced mentally, then only terrorism could, can be put to an end. If not, only by physical forces, terrorism may not be controlled. How long the government uh, tries it, then so long as they got support from across the, the border and if they are Mentality is not convinced and if they don't have mental satisfaction, terrorism may continue. That's why it does not mean that 
after it is UT, it will be completely controlled by the government. Th that is not the case. So the point lies in influencing them and the point lies in convincing the, the terrorists to give up violence and to live democratic life. Thank you, sir. Another question asked by Tapes Dole. Uh, he asked that what would be the role of the political parties of that region to maintain peace and tranquility? Please repeat the question, Bondita. Uh, role of the political parties of that region to maintain peace. Yeah. Yes, we know there are two strong regional parties in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, PDP and National Conference and among the regional parties. Then from the national parties, there are also Bharatiya Janata Party and Indian National Congress. So all these political parties, instead of taking cheap political advantage out of the ongoing situation, they should put their heads together and they should think for the long-term plan how long-term peace and long-term solution can be uh, processed in the union territories of Jammu and Kashmir, then in Ladakh also. And Ladakh side, it is not that much problematic because terrorist activities is also not at all that active in that side. But the main is with Jammu and Kashmir. That's why in this regard, all the political parties, whether national parties or regional parties, they should think for the long-term plan and they should not take cheap political advantage out of the situation and all should think the nation first and how a uh, real solution, lasting solution can be brought in the union territory. So I think political parties, both national and regional, they have a great assignment to do in this regard. Uh, another question was from Mintu Pathak. Uh, he asked that China is the main conspirator to uphold the issue of Jammu and Kashmir from background in between India and Pakistan to de uh, destabilize peace process and to resist development in this region only for its own benefits. What is your opinion, sir? China is the main conspirator, he stated. Yeah. Uh for more than seven decades, elsewhere Jammu and Kashmir state was a special status state under Article 370. And government of India also pumped a lot of money there. But uh, whether re development really took place or not, people of the state may be the best judge to make that judgment, I think. And like after the abrogation of Article 370, what did Union Home Minister Amit Shah uh, declare to the media? Earlier, the financial benefits, all resources, financial aid, and whatever we provided to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, it was benefited only by two, three families. But now it will be under administration of the union government. It is now union territory. So this benefit will not be restricted only, only to two, three families, but it will be inclusive now. Or it will be extended to all the citizens. That is the claim of the home minister. That's why so far as development or economic development is concerned. It seems uh, development is not balanced and development is not adequate as part of the funding. Okay, sir. Uh, we'll take another two questions only. Uh, one participant, uh, he asked that, what is your idea on the nature of Indian federalism? in the light of abrogation of Article 370. See, many say that India is a federal state. But 
nowhere in the constitution of India federalism is mentioned. mentioned. So India is federal by structure. Federal by structure in the sense there is two types of government, union government and state government. And both the union government and state government, they derive their power from the constitution. Just because of that, by the structure, India is federal. But in the constitution, nowhere in the constitution, from article one up to the last article, it is never mentioned India is a federal state. So instead of mentioning India as a, a federal state, in article one, what is mentioned? India, that is Bharat, is a union of state. So India is a union of state, but India is not a federal state where power is divided between the union government and the state government. That's why uh, one should not strictly claim that India is a federal state. It is federal by structure only, but it is nowhere mentioned in the constitution of India. That's why as a union of state, union government or union parliament is authorized to do, is authorized to take up what should be necessary for protecting the sovereignty and integrity of India. Um, the last question uh, from Manasuti Sharma. Uh, he asked that, do you think abrogation of Article 370 will help to develop educational sector in Jammu and Kashmir as internet services not properly working there? See, I've already mentioned in my lecture also. Up till now, Terrorism from across the border is daily disturbing the administration and many, many security forces are employed here to defend against these terrorist activities. Because of that, normal functioning is still disturbed. Then internet is also not properly functioning up till now. That's why so long as these terrorist activities are going on, and these law and order situations are going on. The governing authority also may try its level best to control, to contain this terrorism and to put in order and to control the law and order in such a way at this juncture, we cannot expect everything to change overnight. As I've said, this Kashmir issue, it is more than seven decades old problem. That's why it should not be expected to be solved overnight. It may take time. Uh, okay, sir. I think um, all the questions have been successfully answered by your resource person. And I hope that all the participants have enjoyed the session a lot. Um, thank you, Professor Dongel, sir, for your wonderful speech. It is really interesting. And I convey my sincere thanks to you for spending your valuable time with us and sharing uh, your knowledge with us within a short period of, period of time uh, because it is uh, difficult to discuss such a relevant topic within a short period of time, but you have still uh, uh, co uh, covered everything in your presentation. And thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Bolin Hazrika sir from the beginning. Hazrika sir, do you want to say something? He has to unmute. Tell yes, him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bolin Hazrika sir, unmute yourself. Yeah, he has to unmute. Ah, he's coming. Uh, do you so, want to? Yes, sir. The grand session. And uh, I will congratulate uh, the organizers as well as Dr. Thang, um, uh, our resource person, uh, because uh, he has mentioned all the things from the beginning and uh, till the date and covered all the important incidents related to each the topic. So uh, I think uh, the uh, you one who has listened to his uh, deliberation will not be in, in any kind of necessity to go through the books to have uh, our knowledge from any other source. It was such a good deliberation. So my special thanks to the resource person as well as 
the to the organizers of this session thank you that's all yes, sir thank you so much uh, now i request tibako nat sir assistant professor of the department of political science to the college to deliver his vote of thanks tibako sir please unmute yourself Good evening, good evening, everyone. Myself, Dibakar Nath. Uh, I am such a long and informative, successful lecture. I am audible. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. He gives me an immense pleasure, pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this webinar to all. Firstly, we want to express our gratitude to the distinguished person of this webinar, Mr. Jit Dangal. We spare these precious times for us and deliver a very resourceful and informative lecture on the topic. <clears throat> Secondly, I would like to thanks our principal, Dr. Lalit Chandrava, for your cooperation and arrange to arrange this webinar. And I extend our sincere thanks, to Dr. Bolin Hazuri Gasar, President of the Political Science Association, for delivering the unique address. And for being our backbone in our endeavors. A warm thanks to our head of the SUD, Dr. Prasanta Sarma, for his keynote address. And I would like to thank to all the dignitaries, faculty members of the Center for Ethnic Studies and Research for allowing us to arrange this event. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants whose active participation being made the webinar successful. Thank you so much. So much we look forward to the same for future also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Konat, sir. Um, one thing that made asking for the slides that Professor Dongle sir, has been uh, shared. Uh, sir, will you share your slide with us? Then uh, I will send to you by email. Okay, sir. Mm, that will be better. Okay, okay. You will send it in email, and I will share it in the group. Okay. 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 Uh, another announcement for the participants. I request the participants that if, uh, if you have missed any part of our session because of your uh, loan network connection, or because of you join lately, then please visit our YouTube channel uh, because YouTube live is also going on. Um, our YouTube channel. Please Center for Ethnic Studies and Research. Okay. Uh, uh, with all this, I would like to conclude this session. And once again, I offer my sincere gratitude and thanks to all the participants, our respected research persons, and other guests. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.